What happens when your worst fear becomes your reality? Hi, I'm Brent Cassidy. Welcome to the Nightmare Success In and Out podcast, where we explore how to overcome your fears and nightmares to set yourself free. We're going to be exploring this topic with guys and women that I was at Leavenworth with and others who served at other prisons and jails. We're going to, we're going to be talking about life before prison, life in prison, and life out of prison. These stories can be inspiring, sometimes sad, there's some humor, but hopefully you can come away with a nugget of something that will help you knock down some of the prisons you've built up in your own mind. So today, folks, I am here sitting with Mikey Bobson, which we got this corrected because I had Mikey Vasquez done, which we had to do a spin on this, and everybody <laughs> knows there's Mikey Bobson, so we had to get that right because we want everybody to know who you are, right, Mikey? Absolutely. Welcome. Hi, thank you. Good to be here. Okay, so this is this is fun because I, uh, for those listening at home, uh, Brandon Reed was a guest probably like three or four episodes ago, and he had been through a crazy experience where he was trying to get some housing, and he he actually works with people who 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 second chance housing. And it was a big story uh, in the St. Louis newspaper. Well, Mikey works with works with Brandon, and Brandon says, "Hey, you got to talk to this girl. She's got one hell of a story." And I said, "Yeah, I, that's exactly what I want to do." So, Mikey, whatever Brandon says, he says you've got a great story. So yes. let's jump into this. All right. Uh, take me back. So, are you from St. Louis? Um. Well, I'm from Belleville, Illinois, so I'm about a half an hour east. I know of, her Belleville. Lots yeah. of guys I know from Belleville. <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I'm from. Yes. And what was uh, Mikey doing growing up? Um, what was life like for you growing up, Mikey? Trying to find a place to fit in, I guess, is what I was doing um, growing up. So, um, my mom, my mom was a severe alcoholic. Yeah. Um, and my dad tried to, my dad tried to make up, right, for, for the that. fact that my mom was such a bad alcoholic. And did you have siblings? I did not. So it was a, you were an only child dealing with a mom who was a severe alcoholic. Okay. Absolutely. Um, my my mom and dad got divorced when I was two. Yeah. Um, you know, my dad wanted to be sober himself, and my mom did not. My dad finally did um, get completely sober when I was five, okay. but their relationship was very toxic, right? So they've both always been in my life, but I don't ever remember them being together. I think it would be tougher too, Mikey, because, you know, when you have a sibling or siblings, it's like, you know, us against them, you know, oh, I can't believe how mom's acting or, yeah. you know, dad's really off the wall tonight. You didn't have that. It was just yeah. you it and you were, you were in a tough environment. Yeah. And I, and it, and it was scary. Um, you know, and my mom did the best she could. Don't get me wrong. Um, she was in school for a while, and she was bartending at night, and we were in and out of different public housing. So um, that was tough at times. There was places that were infested with roaches. You know, we dealt with all of that. Did um, you feel danger? Like, were you in a place where things, bad things were happening? Not, well. Not really? Not really. Um I was at my grandma's a lot of nights because my mom was always bartending at night while she was trying to get through school. Mm -hmm. um, and then she finally did get through school and she got a good job in St. Louis as a computer programmer. But she was at the bar every night when yeah. she got off work. Yeah. And um, when when we got out of the place that was real bad with uh, the roaches, we we got a place real close to my grandma. So it was like literally a walk away. So my grandma took care of me most nights and my mom would always come home and be pretty drunk by the time she got home. Um you was know, your so. grandmother aware of all the hardship that you were going through as a kid with your mom? Um, yes. My yeah. she would beg to adopt me, but my mom would never let her. Yeah. You know, my 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 grandparents they were pretty big. They were big drinkers too. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know they were more like functioning alcoholics. Like there was a full bar in the basement. There was always a big party. There was people over. They were always drinking. Just and like senior citizen Floridians. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. There you go. And I would, you know, I I enjoyed like at a very early age. 
me and my cousins would sit and we would watch like yeah. all the adults get drunk yeah. and drink. And, Entertainment. Yeah, and my mom smoked pot and I knew it wasn't cigarettes when I would smell it, yeah. but I didn't know exactly what it was. But at a very early age, I could not wait to get older so that I could get drunk and smoke weed. To be like I, I mean, that. at a very Because that's what age. you'd been modeled to see. Because that's, I mean, it was, I thought it was fun. Yeah. But I always said to myself, but you know, I'm never going to be like my mom because I couldn't understand why at the end of the night, my mom was so much drunker than everybody else and why she could not um, control herself. Was it scary as it, a kid? I, I wondered, because I didn't, yes. I always wonder like with, with kids at a certain age, even at five years old, um, how much aware you are, how wrong things are, and do you do you feel it? Do you yes. like you feel it? Yes, it was um, it was it was very scary. I am. I remember. I I hated when my mom would drink gin, and I would beg her, "Mama, just drink beer today. Just mm-hmm. drink beer because it was never quite as bad." Um, I would always like wait to see how early she started drinking. And um, it, 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 it was very... So you were measuring all that. All that at a very um, early age. Mm. And I would often have to... How old do you think you would have been? Like when you started thinking, I don't want mom to drink gin. I want her to drink beer. Probably seven for sure. Yeah. Seven for sure. That's a lot for yeah. a, a seven-year-old to yes. be thinking about. Absolutely. Seven for sure. And, you know, my dad would have me on Wednesdays and every other weekend, but... I always would feel so bad. I wouldn't want to leave my mom because she would, I was scared. I was scared she wasn't going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And there was, um, you know, the, the guilt trips when I would leave and um, I would feel really bad and I was scared for her. Um, she was also bipolar mm. and suicidal. Um, and one night that, that I'll never forget that really stands out in my head um, and is a big part of my story is my mom, one night she was in her room in bed crying And I went in there and I said, Mama, what's wrong? And she said, Mikey, do you see them? And I said, do I see what? And she said, the demons, Mikey, they're crawling up my curtains. And she was shaken and she was crying and she was scared. And I then became very frightened. And, of course, I didn't see anything, but I didn't know what to do. So I I got next to her in bed. I curled up by her. I held her and we both cried until we fell asleep. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. So how did life change for you as you got older going to the high school years? Um, and well, you know, and here's the thing at a very early, at a very young age, I never, I never really felt right. I just never really felt accepted, you Mm -hmm. know? Um, and and that's a common characteristic that people who suffer with addiction share. Mm -hmm. We never um, felt like we quite fit in. We never quite felt, you know, I wasn't blonde enough, I wasn't skinny enough, but I wasn't Latina enough, but I wasn't white enough, black enough, like I wasn't, I was like never just enough, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And I just, I I was always, I hated having my friends over, um, because I was always so embarrassed of my mom, and um, it was, it was just really tough for me, and then when I was about 11 years old, I found her weed, you know, and, um, and, and that was when my life really took a spin because I, I found her weed and I smoked her weed and I was the most popular kid in the neighborhood that Mm -hmm. summer. But, um, but I felt good. I finally felt good. I felt, I felt like I was enough. Um, now on every Friday night, my mom would have, um, special nights and I was, you know, when, when I was kind of, younger when I was like eight nine I would have my Shirley Temples in a wine glass but then by the time I was 11 I was allowed to actually have wine coolers on Friday nights but um you know I, I never really I was always scared to really get drunk because of how my mom would get you'd seen things yeah but when I found that weed I um I really liked it and I felt like I fit in and um you know it just progressed from there it went downhill from there all throughout high school I was smoking weed all the time at that point I you know was getting drunk all the time um what were your I, friends like in that point point where you, did you have friends that were in the same type of predicament or did you I I you, did yeah? I I searched out it's like I made it my mission to um search out like the possible like worst influences I could find because yeah. I thought they were cool yeah. right and um you know my family so I went through a time in high school um my mom's Puerto Rican and um 
even though they were Puerto Rican, there was a hatred for Puerto Ricans when, when my grandpa moved here from the States, or I'm sorry, when he moved to the States from Puerto Rico when he was 18. Um, people hated them here, mm. and um, they, they were pretty racist against them. So my, my grandfather tried really hard to fit in and to just be white, mm -hmm. right? And he had a thick accent and dark skin, but he wanted to be white. And um, he, uh, there was also a hatred for, um, there was a hatred for, for black people um, and in my family. And um, apparently that was going on in Puerto Rico too, as, as it is in so many parts of this world and even still to this day. And I, and I hated that. Mm -hmm. I hated that and I thought it was terrible and I didn't want to be anything like them. So um, throughout high school, I kind of made it my mission to hang out with um, lots of, Lots of black people, lots of Mexicans, lots of Latinas. Like I was hanging out in the hood. I was hanging yeah. out. I was hanging out with like um, the the baddest people I could find in like the poorest and worst parts parts of society because I did not want to be like my family, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but that also came with it a lot of trouble for me, right? Because I while I portrayed this um, tough image of like this little. Latina Mexican gangster in my black lipstick and my dark curly hair, my dicky overalls. Mm -hmm. I really wasn't right. I really wasn't. So people were scared of me and nobody messed with me. But if they would have, I got beat up, you know, so I, I, I was in places I shouldn't have been in doing things I shouldn't have been doing. I was eating acid, drinking, I was getting drunk and, um, and my life was going downhill really quick. So did, I mean, did you feel like when that started happening like that, did you feel like you were out of control or did it feel like your life was spinning um, out of control? How did you feel when that was all happening to you? At that point, at that point, not, not really so much because I wanted so bad to be smoking the weed and drinking and mm -hmm. hanging out with the people I was. Um, I, there was always such terrible fights when I would go home with my mom. Um, eventually she kicked me out when I was 17 and um, my dad was trying to have a, a whole other marriage, right? So he let me stay there for a couple of weeks. But, um, you know, my dad was sober at this time. He was a social worker himself. He was a therapist. He was embracing his Catholic faith, trying to have a marriage and a whole other family. And me coming home drunk every night and stoned out of my brain, you know, at the age of 17, that didn't work. So that only lasted for three weeks. And he kicked me out and I um, moved in with a boyfriend that I had. And that was terrible. And he... Um, he beat the crap out of me for, for, for a good year. And on my 18th birthday, I got my first tattoo. And uh, when I came home, he was a man that another man touched my leg. And, he, and he, he started beating on me pretty good. And by the grace of God, the neighbor heard it and came to the door. And I was able to grab my car keys. And I ran out of that apartment. And, um, and, and I left. And I got in my car and I left. And, and I never went back. And I did move back in with my mom, but only very temporarily. And I... And, and I was 18 at this point, and, um, and um, I moved in with my mom, started doing cocaine, and for some reason, I got it in my head <laughs> that, um, you know, the, the problem was is that I was hanging out with the wrong, like, I was hanging out with, um, you know, with all these, like, um, you know, black people and Hispanic people and doing bad things with them, and that must be the problem, so I made it. I literally made a decision in my head, okay, I'm going to start hanging out with white people now, the white people that are doing drugs, and things will work. Things will be better. And as crazy as that sounds, yeah. that's my story, and that's literally what I thought in my head. You figured so that that was going to be your new rationale. I, I thought that was going to be my new rationale, and I was um, doing cocaine at this point, getting some acid one night, and that's when I met my ex-husband. I was 18, and... Um, partying with all these crazy white kids and um a couple months later we were cooking crystal meth and that was a whole different world that's when i felt my life like was spinning was spinning and spiraling out of control it sure seems like that you know all the different people i've talked to that have been around drugs that whenever they cross into that world of the meth and the crystal meth that is when things get Absolutely. Uh, uh, Kyle Kilossing was on a couple of podcasts ago, and he was number four golfer, team golfer in the world, living the life that you would only want. Yeah. And he 
had the bad thing happen, got into crystal meth and, and he became an escapee from prison and his whole life changed. And yeah. that seems like meth has a, a, a demon in it that affects people so differently. It, 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 it was, it, it was awful. You know, um, I liked it a lot better than cocaine because you didn't fiend out as much and it, and it would last a lot longer. But I mean, it, it, it was just a completely different world. Nothing that I had ever been um, exposed to before. And, you know, by the time I was, you know, 19, and that was the anhydrous meth back then, right? So this isn't your ice that's on the street now. This isn't your shake and bake that was before the ice. Like, this was this was the anhydrous dope, and it was scary, and you had to steal the anhydrous. And, um, and I had cops you know, watching me and kicking in my door when I was 19 years old. And, um, and, and I was, and I was scared to death. And so when they did that, when they were, you had cops that were kicking in your door, were they kicking in the door because you guys were making meth or were they kicking in the door because you're making meth and selling meth or was they kicking in the door because they knew you guys were addicts or what, what were, was the kick in the door? So they, they had been watching us. Um, <laughs> they had been watching us. Um, the, my ex-husband and his friends, they had been out cooking a batch um, that uh, the week before, and everything got really strange, and I, I'll never know what exactly happened, but um, things got weird, and cops were watching, and they all ran off in different directions and showed up back at my apartment um, at different times, and I never got the full story as to what happened, but I know that the week following that, I had, like, cops calling my house phone, mm. like, acting like acting like they were like the Domino's pizza driver. Did we order some pizzas and, but knowing our names and, um, and it was just really weird. And my ex-husband knew what was going on. And so we got rid of like all the drugs and everything associated with it. We had all got rid of it. And thank God, cause two days later I was pouring a bowl of cereal and <laughs> the detective literally looked at my window and said, open your door, Mikey. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, and I, I thought my ex-husband was just tripping. I didn't think anybody was really having our phones chat. Like, I was like, what are you talking about? Like, but they did. And um, they came in and one of the guys that was staying with me had a parole violation, but then they searched our house and they had been watching us, but they didn't find anything. So I kind of had a, you know, close, um, call. close call, right? And and but that detective later um, knew me very well. Years later, when he did end up arresting me, so. <laughs> well, let's let's go into that because so you had a close call. Did that yeah. scare you into hey, we need to stop this, well, or or that was okay? We're past that. We were okay. So um, I mean, yeah, it did scare me, and yes, um, we did kind of stop things for a while. Um, you know. <laughs> We slowed down things for a while, um, but I still wasn't sober or nothing, but we weren't doing the meth at that time so much anymore. And really what ended up happening was I got pregnant with my first son when I was 21, right? And um, I got pregnant with my, my first I've got five kids. I got pregnant with my first son, and I quit doing everything. Like, I quit using all dr- I didn't even drink caffeine. How hard like, was that? It, it was it was extremely hard, but I was so happy and excited to be pregnant, to be pregnant yeah. that like it was awesome. But like I had I had a quarter gram of dope put up for when I after I had the baby and I quit breastfeeding. Right. You know, um, and my ex-husband was still getting high throughout all that time. And I really like ha- I really thought in my head that I'm going to be this super cool mom and I'm still going to party and get high. But like I'm still going to be a good mom. And like I really had this idea in my head. Um, needless to say, I had the baby, (laughs) um, breastfed for a couple months, stopped doing that, did that quarter gram of dope. And, um, once again, my life spiraled out of control. I was hanging out with more people who were cooking. He was in and out doing all kinds of stuff. Um, and I got really, really, really bad in about a nine month time period and, um, found out I was pregnant again by the grace of God. I quit everything again. Um, Actually, DCFS showed up at my door a week after I got pregnant with my second son. But by the grace of God, I was sober because I had found out I was pregnant. And they weren't there for drugs. I, I don't really, I don't really remember exactly why they had got the call. But they never opened a case, right? Because um, I was stable and I was doing the best I could when they showed up. And I was, I was sober again. I don't know about stable, sober, <laughs> sober again. A week sober, right? Um, and 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 you know, and that went on, right? So when I got pregnant with my second son, I told myself, okay, okay. No, no to the hard drugs. Mikey, you can't do the hard drugs. Look how bad you got. DCFS showed up at your door. Lord only knows. 
but I'm always going to smoke pot. Like mm-hmm. I said, I couldn't, because I couldn't picture a life, life without, without something, right? right? I, I I was Mikey. I had to smoke weed, right? Well, at 11 years old, that was your escape. And at so, 11 years yeah. old, that was my escape, right? So, um, and, and, and I did better, right? Mm-hmm. I, I made it about four months breastfeeding my second child, um, not doing any hard drugs, not even smoking weed. Well, my ex-husband was still doing hard drugs, and he came home with some meth, and, you know, I, I started doing it again. Luckily, that didn't last very long, and I found out I was pregnant with my third son. <laughs> and people always joke. They always say, well, birth control is the only drug you didn't do, Mike. Exactly. You didn't do that one. Right. And, and, and I said to myself, okay, this, I'm really not doing the hard drugs. I'll always smoke weed, but I'm really not doing the hard drugs. Well, for about three years after my third son was born, I only smoked weed. I worked. I drove. I was really, I was actually doing really well for myself at that time. He was still doing the hard drugs, not the meds. Well, I was going to ask you, like, how are the kids? Like, like at this point, you've got probably like a three-year-old, right. whatever, two-year-old. Uh, are, is it, are you functioning? I was extreme. So after my third son was born, um, like I said, for about three years, I was extremely functioning. Okay. Um, people always said, you know, Mikey, she's a She's a, she's a bad chick, uh-huh. right? You know, because I, I worked, I took care of my kids. Yes, I smoked weed, but I didn't do the hard drugs like they all still did, mm-hmm. like my ex-husband still did. I didn't do those things, and I was maintaining, and I was on top of my business um, until my one night, I don't know, my youngest son was probably three or four. My ex-husband was smoking crack in the basement, and I was down there smoking my weed, and I said, pass me that crack pipe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, oh, my gosh. Now, when I tell you my life plummeted after that. I mean, it plummeted. Um, I started smoking crack with him. And um, I remember not even wanting to like make my kids a pizza because all I wanted to do was sit in that basement and smoke crack. And of course, I'd go up and make them the pizza. But you know, it was just awful. It was just awful. Like, all I wanted to do was smoke crack. And, um, and it was terrible. And I began stealing stuff from my ex-husband. You know, my ex-husband could always function a little better than me. He could go to sleep with an eight ball of cocaine in the closet. He never stole from anybody, right? He could, you know, hold down a job and, you know, smoke his dope and then go to bed. Like, I, I was not, I was not mm-hmm. capable you of, were obsessed of quite all that. The way through. Yeah. I was obsessed and I started stealing his stuff. I pawned our wedding rings. Um, I would steal money from my own children. My oldest son would hide his wallet in different places thinking that I wouldn't find it. And I would find it every time. And it breaks my heart to think back to that. Um, and, you know, and I always had the intentions of, I'll replace it. Mm-hmm. I'll get some money and I'll replace it. But, you know, that that would never happen. And and then then I got on the pain pills because people were tired of seeing Mikey smoke crack all day. So here's some pain pills. Try this buzz. And then I was hooked on them. And then it was heroin. And then it was methadone clinics. And then I'm pregnant with my fourth child on 180 milligrams of methadone. Mm. And my life was out of control, and I, and I was robbing everybody in my family that I loved. I, I stole from my mom and my grandma for uh, probably a year and a half before they ever found out. I would go, and I'd take a piece of jewelry every day, and I'd go pawn it. And, and nobody even knew that I was doing heroin. They thought that I was only on pain pills all this time, even my ex-husband, because he never did the heroin. He was a speed guy, and I was... Um, I, was I was gone. My, so when you, when you were stealing, did you feel bad about it or did you have it rationalized somehow in your mind that this is just my life I'm making it work I felt horrible about it and I always thought that I would go back to the pawn shop and get what I took what you taken until yeah. I'd taken almost every piece of gold my mom and my grandma owned um did you know, they did they um did the kids or your grandmother or anybody did they confront you on that they finally did. Um, and my ex-husband didn't even know that I was on heroin. Wow. I had everybody snowed to think that I was only addicted to pain pills. And I happened to get in a car accident when my pain pill addiction first started. Um, why did I get in the car accident? Well, because I was sick on pain pills. And I was trying not to be sick. And somebody handed me an Elevil and I couldn't keep my eyes open. Mm. And, I, and I got in a car accident. Um, and uh, so I happened to have a legal script of pain pills. And... Everybody thought I was just on pain pills. My, my ex-husband literally had no clue that I was actually doing heroin, and then everybody found out. Everybody found out because um, I trusted one of his friends who was actually one of our crack dealers, but I told her. I told her that I was a mess and that I was um, on heroin and that um, I had actually just gotten myself in a methadone clinic, right? I had just gotten myself in a methadone clinic. I was three weeks in a methadone clinic, Still so jacked up on the methadone that I couldn't stay awake. My I was nodding out into my food, 
it was terrible and um and that I'd been stealing from my family and she ended up telling my ex-husband what was going on she called my mom and told my mom what was going on and um they had a felony warrant out for my arrest my mom and my grandma did um because they found all their jewelry had was gone Mm -hmm. And they were supposed to come get me the next morning at the methadone clinic, but my dad talked them into calling it off that next morning. And my ex-husband took the kids, and he and he almost left me. Um, but I was going to get better, right? I was mm-hmm. going to be in this methadone clinic, and I was going to get better. And that didn't happen. Methadone was terrible. That methadone was awful. Um, I was a wreck. I think I was more... I was more incoherent on the methadone than I was on the heroin. You know, I I would try to get my kids off the bus and I'd be asleep and I'd be knotted out. And and it was, it was a nightmare. It it, it was awful. It was, it was awful. So when did this, when did rock bottom hit? Okay. I mean, because this is a lot, this this is is a lot, Mikey, that you've been through as a kid. And then getting your own addiction and then having your kids and them yeah. being involved in that. So what, where did you go to, to right. at some point you probably had a rock bottom moment. Right. I, oh yeah. So, okay. So let's, all right. Um, I got pregnant with my daughter when I was in the methadone clinic, my fourth child had her, um, I was supposed to be weaning off of methadone, but I was scared and I wasn't doing it. Me and him were still, you know, smoking crack and doing other drugs. And um, um, I ended up going to treatment. Um, he, I went to get my kids off the school bus one day, and they never got off the bus. Well, come to find out, he had an order of protection against me. And I didn't know this at the time, but the police told him, if you don't get an order of protection against her, we're going to call DCFS. Because I was walking my daughter through the town of Mascuta. She was in her stroller, but I was apparently pretty messed up. I was nodding out. I was probably on some sort of Adderall, too, and I was doing weird body movements. And they said, you, we're going we're gonna to get, you know, we're going to call DCFS. So he got an order of protection against me. Um, he was working his way up to that anyways. He had been gone about a month because we were fighting so bad and it was just me and the kids there and I, and I was a mess. So um, I couldn't go home because he had the order of protection and um, I went to a little motel room and I truly had felt at that moment like I lost <coughs> I lost everything, right? My oldest son was 10, you know? Um, my oldest son was 10. I'd always been there with him and did the best I could to be a mom. And now I'm in this little motel room, and I didn't know what to do. And my dad took me to the methadone clinic every day and paid for the hotel room. And... Um, and, and, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I'd lost, I'd lost my children. I lost my whole world. And um, it was a whole new level of pain, a whole new level of pain that I absolutely could not cope with. And I drank and I ate Adderall and I got my methadone dose. And um, two weeks later, my ex-husband comes and, you know, walks in that hotel room and he says, you don't need to be in here. You go to, you go to treatment, you get off that methadone and you can come home to your family. And And I called and I got a bed in the Women's Treatment Center in Chicago and I had to wait five days for my bed. And him and my baby girl, who was nine months, stayed with me, stayed with me at the hotel room. He didn't want my older kids to see me because there was the order of protection and he was afraid they'd say something to somebody and he could get in trouble. So they stayed with me. How old would your kids have been at this time, Mike? So my baby was nine months and then I had, um, um, my oldest was 10 and then I had a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old boy. Okay. And um, so him and my daughter stayed with me until my bed was open. He kissed me goodbye. I was supposed to go get better, lower on the methadone, and come home. I went to treatment, and when I was a month into treatment, um, he moved another woman in my home. Um, I called home one day to talk to the kids like we did every day, and my um, my 8-year-old son answer I'm sorry my nine-year-old son answered the phone and he said we don't want Becca for our mommy we want you for our mommy Mm. and he moved another woman in so I when I got out of that treatment center needless to say I relapsed now I want to make this very clear even if that wouldn't have happened I would have relapsed anyways because I that was not my time that was not Totally, my time. You weren't totally committed. Yeah. I w- right. But yeah. it, needless to say, that devastated me. My, my kids were counting down days for me to come home. Yeah. I had letters. I still have them at home that say, Mommy, 80 more days left. They were counting down days to come home for Mommy to come home, and I didn't. I never came home. They were devastated, and this woman was sleeping in my bed, taking care of my children, wearing my clothes. Like, it was it was ridiculous. And um, so when I left that treatment center, I went right back to that same hotel room, and I began using needles. 
I never really used needles before, but um, because when I would, I was too messed up that I couldn't take care of my children. But I had lost my children at this point, and I didn't care anymore. Um, I got lower on my dose of methadone, but I didn't get completely off it in that treatment center because I was on such a high dose. So I um, I was still in the clinic when I got home, but at this point, I didn't even care anymore. Um, methamphetamines had made a comeback in the area at this time with that shake and bake stuff, and um, I started shooting it up. And um, I started shooting it up, and I started catching cases. I started getting felonies. I literally entered the land of I don't care. I lived every single minute of my life to use. I did what girls did to get money, to get drugs, Mm -hmm. right? I turned tricks. I got drugs. I got high. Turned tricks, got drugs, got high. Eat, you know, wash, rinse, repeat. That's what I did. And that's all I did. That is what my life had been reduced to. Um, and, 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 and I did finally catch my first felony. Little, little, uh, little funny piece here. <laughs> my ex-husband, right? He, um, he would let me see my kids periodically whenever he would want to come see me because he would be fighting with whatever girl he had staying there. And, um, but when he found out that I was using a needle, that was the end of that. He wouldn't, he wouldn't let me see him anymore. He never brought him back to see me, which was for the best thing. But, um, he called me and wanted me to come see him one time. And, um, I showed up there and, um, he, he did the dope with me and then let me see my kids for about four days. And, um, then he, uh, told me, told me I had to leave that, you know, I couldn't stay there anymore. The other girl and him had made up. She was going to come back, blah, 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 blah. So um, I left, and uh, two weeks went by, and he wouldn't even let me talk on the phone to my kids to, like, tell them why I wasn't there anymore, to tell them that I wish I could still be there or something. And I showed up at his house because I told him, you don't pick up that phone and let me talk to my kids and explain something to them. I'm going to show up. And I showed up at his house, and I had dope in my pocket. And him and that other girl didn't know what to do. And I walked in, and he called the cops on me, and that's how I caught my first felony. He's he was <laughs> very hypocritical a lot of times. He was. I well, I mean, obviously, because right. I mean, he was he was using all along. Right. Very hypocritical, but he was a charmer, right? So, anyways, that was the best thing that could have happened to me, though, because I was introduced to the legal system, which is where I eventually got help. Now, horrible things happened in that county jail. I remember quite a few of them. Um, while I was in there, one of my close friends was in the mail was on the mail side, mm-hmm. right? And um, he actually hung himself in that jail. And um, everybody says that he didn't really hung himself, that the officers did it and made it look like um, like he hung himself. And his family sued that jail, and they got a whole lot of money. But, you know, that happened while I was in there. I had never been incarcerated before. I never had to go to the bathroom in front of other women before. Um, yeah, it's a whole lifestyle. It, it, it was a whole different change. Now, luckily, I knew so many people in that jail. The minute I walked in, mm-hmm. everybody had my back because everybody knew Mikey. Yeah. Like, so I had already had a little name for myself. So, um, Which would help you in jail. Right, which really helped me in jail yeah. because – you know, thank God I wasn't the poor girls no, that, that, crazy, that didn't place, have that, right. you know, and I would always feel real sorry for them, but yeah. I had to stay, I had to stay with all these girls that had my back. Right. So what, Mikey, because you were in there and you knew some of the people and whatever, I, uh, were you thinking I'm going to, this is something I'm going to get out of, or you thought, man, I'm really in this thing deep. I might not. Well, you know, so my first, you know, my first time in there, um, I was scared to death. Once I kind of got used to it, you know, I actually started to enjoy myself. Um, we kicked it with the, uh, with the girls. I was sober. I was clean. And I, and I thought in my head, well, when I get out, you know, I'm going to try to do better and I'm going to try to get my kids back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and of course that didn't happen. I, I was, um, I was in and out of that jail multiple multiple times and every time I'd get of course be clean in there and then you know have good intentions when I got out how many times you think you ran through there um, as you were going through all this so I ran through there three different times I caught three different felony cases and ran through there three different times now mind you every time I would get out I'd go back to doing my meth okay and the the drug tactical unit which was the DTU that kicked in my door when I was 19, um, 
they knew <laughs> who I was and I was cooking meth again. I was shaking and baking. And um, so every single time I would get out, they knew me because I, I knew everybody. I knew every, everybody would always say Mikey brings an entourage with her because I knew everybody and I would have, I would hang out with like every single, you know, dope cook or big dope guy in the St. Clair County area. So these DTU agents, they loved watching me. They would watch me. <coughs> they would follow me. They were trying to get me to snitch on people, right? They were, I mean, it was a constant game for them and, and they'd catch it with some dope and they'd let you go. Okay. They'd let you go on the conditions that you would bring them a dope dealer, right? That you would bring them a dope dealer and they would call your cell phone and they would come pick you up and they would even give you the money to go make the undercover buy and they would take you to the spot to do it. But here's the catch. If you didn't do it, they'd hit you with that felony <laughs> warrant, however many months later. And they cared nothing about you. They, they, they didn't care a thing about you or the trouble that could be waiting for you if you snitched on this dope dealer. They just knew you wanted out of jail, and they would use you. They were just using, <coughs> they were just using you. Using yeah. you like a little, like a little pawn. Um, and, 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 and it was awful. And, um, you know... <sighs> I did the, you know, I went to the treatment centers after jail. Um, you know, I did the probations and, and I just kept repeating the same cycle. And then one of the time, the third time I was incarcerated, I got out, went to treatment, went into an Oxford house and I was, um, I was clean and sober and I found out I was pregnant and I was super excited. I thought, man, this will be great. This is the motivation I need to stay sober. I can be a mom again. Well, I ended up having a miscarriage. And I, and I was really mad at God after that. And I, and I relapsed again that day that I found out I, I was having a miscarriage and, um, I couldn't understand, you know, I'd say, God, you've already taken four kids from me. Here I am clean and sober doing everything right. And now you've taken a fifth child from me. And I had a huge resentment against God and, um, and I relapsed again. And, um, this is where I hit my rock bottom. Okay. I immediately, in back into this world of meth, hardcore and heavy, the DTU, they were watching me, trying to get me to set people up. They were, I would get people dope, and they were having people come to me and do undercover buys. They were on my Facebook page. They knew my phone number. They were calling me. They were pulling up on me at the Metrolink, like madness, craziness, chaos, and, um, and, 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 it, and it was awful. It was hell, and... Um, so this goes on probably for about a year and a half, maybe two years, and I found out I was pregnant again. And I knew within, with every fiber of my being, I knew that I was having a little girl as soon as I found out I was pregnant. Sorry, that that's was a, fine. That's, that's my that's reminder. A girl. I got to set remind. No, that's my <laughs> reminder. So I remember to do various things, but um, I knew I was. I knew it was a little girl, and I knew I wasn't going to miscarry. Yeah. And I knew that that baby was going to be born perfectly healthy, even if I would have kept shooting up crystal meth every day. I knew that baby was going to be born healthy, but I also knew that uh, DCFS would take her from me at the hospital if I didn't stop living the way I was living. And I also knew that I really wanted to see my other kids because it had been five years now. Wow. And, um, and almost five years. And, and, I, and I, you know, of course I tried to see him, but he wouldn't let me, and that was for the best. I was a wreck. <coughs> and uh, Probably was at that time, yeah. Yeah, and, and, uh, and, and, and I knew that this was God giving me another chance to be a mom. I knew it. Yeah. And um, I also knew I couldn't keep a needle out of my arm. So I would try. I would, I would sleep about... You know, I'd sleep for a good four or five days because I couldn't stay awake without meth, right? Um, I slept on it. I ate on it. But if I didn't have it, I couldn't hold my eyes open. I would literally sleep for days. And, um, you know, the opiates were the opiates were over. Four overdoses after getting out of that methadone clinic. I, I did opiates maybe four times after the methadone clinic. Overdosed every time. That was the end of that. I, I was like, nope, I'm not doing this. So I was done with that, but I was on the meth so bad. And, um, <laughs> and... And I was sitting there in my dad's house. I had just woke up, you know, after sleeping as long as I could. And I made that phone call, and I got some more dope. And I was shooting up the meth. And then I was vomiting everywhere after every shot I would do because I was pregnant. Mm. 
And I thought to myself, I can't do this anymore. I can't. I hated myself. This is where you hit the rock. This is where I hit my rock bottom. I hated the person I had become. I had all these uh, washed up ideas of this mother I was supposed to be, this daughter I was supposed to be, this child of God. And I was none of those things. I felt like a waste of oxygen. I turned tricks. I got dope. I did dope. And I did it all again. And once again, that was all I was doing. And I'm pregnant. And God's given me another chance. And I'm sitting here with a needle in my arm, puking all over the place. And I... I couldn't. I, I was going to put a bullet in my brain, but I was too chicken to do it. And I, But I couldn't live one more minute like that. And I had to go to probation the next day. And there was a warrant for my arrest. I knew there was a misdemeanor warrant. I didn't know there was a felony warrant, but, um, but I knew I needed help. So I, I put all the rest of my dope up, and I told my daddy. I was staying with my daddy at that time, and I said, let's go. I'm going to go to the courthouse. I'm going to turn myself in. And I turned myself in on that misdemeanor warrant. And um, by the grace of God, the DTU had put out a felony warrant for my arrest because I didn't snitch for him one time. And and that was the best thing that could have happened. So that was my rock bottom. That was my moment of clarity. Um, and that was when I got help. And that was November 29th, 2016, that I turned myself in. Now... Let me let me yeah, tell you. It's really strange because that's when I got out of prison. And that's right. <laughs> that's really, Super strange. Yeah. That's my sobriety date. That was the day I got out of prison from Leavenworth. So when you, you know, because we talk about on this show, th- those are mindset things. You, you until that moment, because I was wanting to get to that rock bottom moment. Yeah. You didn't really feel like you were really going to do it. You know, it wasn't truly committed. And in that moment, you said, no, it's over. At, I'm at, changing. Yeah. Everything about me is going to be different. And I always think it's interesting when that happens because it takes so much determination and so much courage to step out of that because so many people, so many people, Mikey, get into whether it's drugs whether it's a bad marriage, whether it's a bad job, whatever it is, it's a bad routine. It's a bad thing. People get so into that, they can't get out of it because that's what they're used to. That's their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. But you at that moment, you've gone through this hell Mm -hmm. that you've walked through for years. And at that Mm -hmm. moment, you said, no more, I'm different. Well, you know, you have to... Like, I became okay with the way I was living. Mm-hmm. You, you have to in order to keep living that way. Yeah. You've got to at some point just become okay with it. Like, that list of reasons. Like, when I had my kids, I'd wake up every day with a list of reasons why I shouldn't drink or use that day. You know, you got to get your kids off the bus. I mean, you got you to gotta do A, B, and C. You know, and usually five minutes after going over that list of reasons, I'd be drinking or using, yeah. right? But when I lost my kids, I no longer came up with that list of reasons why yeah. I shouldn't. I didn't care. And it's all it's all I did. And I became okay with living like that. I, beca- I became okay with living on an animalistic level. And, um, and, and. But you survived. But I survived it, right? And I became okay amazing. with it until I couldn't be okay with it anymore. Yeah, you reached, Un- the, the, you reached the end. Until I reached and the you end. And, you know, you teetered so closely, to because you're one of the people that haven't gone to prison. And we talked about that there's – jail is really worse than prison because right. prison has – you have a different uh, way of life in prison because everybody's going to be there for a while. And we yeah. you, you figure out how it's going to work, and, and it's yeah. not as transitory or dangerous. But – how did you start stepping back into this life that you're creating now? Because you, you're, okay. you're, you're into a lot of good stuff, Mikey. So, that- so this is the best part of my story. Here we go. Okay. So I'm incarcerated, again, pregnant, which was awful. But you get a, you get two mats to lay on if you're pregnant, That's right? Nice. And you get a peanut butter sandwich at the end of the Extra. night, right? So, okay. Yeah, right. So, um, okay, so... And, and like I told you when we were talking a little bit before this started, I started kind of freaking out, right? Because I knew I needed help and I knew I didn't need to be on the streets anymore. But when I got in there, I was like, oh my gosh, just, I'll just get out of here and I'll just, I'll just, I'll just go home and I'll finish that little bit I got and I'll, I'll put myself in treatment. I just, just, I got to get out of here. This was a bad idea. I should, you know, 
deep down, I knew it was right where I needed to be. But I started calling people to get me money. And I called a guy and, and he and he gave a lawyer $500. He was supposed to come to the courthouse, get me a bond reduction. But no, mm -hmm. the, the lawyer went to the courthouse to get me the bond reduction. And everybody in St. Clair County, if you give a lawyer money and they get everybody on a drug charge. I was on my fourth felony for methamphetamines. But if you give a lawyer money, you get a bond reduction. It's just how it goes. Mm -hmm. But the DTU that had made my life such a miserable living hell told that judge, don't, nope, do not give her a bond. I don't know if he was up at the courthouse. I don't know how it happened, but they wouldn't let me get a bond reduction. And that was God working in my mm -hmm. life, and I didn't even know it. So I was like, oh, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. Um, so I went, you know, everybody in the jail, you go to your, you go before the judge, um, you know, a couple of weeks after you get in there, they read off your charges and they tell you what you're charged with. And you can ask for, you can ask for, you know, to be, if you can get a bond reduction, sure. right. And they read off my charges and I asked for a bond reduction and the, the judge said, nope, but. I will let you go if you can get a bed at a treatment center. I'll let you go to treatment. That wow. was the only way I was getting out of there. Okay. Once again, God's working in my favor. So I've got my dad calling all these treatment centers, trying to get me a bed in treatment. I'm writing public defenders letters every day, um, you know, the whole nine. And, um, and, and I'm incarcerated. And I start. And you're staying clean I, in there. And I'm, and I'm staying clean in there. And, um. I, and I and I was scared. I thought I was going to prison. In fact, I thought, sure, I was going to prison. And, um, you know, my mom would take the baby, you know, while I did my time. I, I knew that that would be okay, but I didn't know how I was going to stay sober when I got out of prison or, or if I, you know, if I was, if, you know, treatment. Yeah. Um, I thought I'd go to treatment and then they'd send me to prison, right? But um, I didn't know how I was going to stay sober. And, um, and I... I cried out to God one day, and I mean, more like I screamed. I mean, I, I threw myself up against the wall. I was in the infirmary, and the, the toilet and the shower were actually kind of separated from the cell um, in this jail, and I threw myself up against the wall over there by the toilet, and I just cried out to God. I said, help me. Help me, please, because I don't know how I'm going to do this. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I didn't even know how sincere that cry was, but God did, right? And um, and I so I thought, well, what can I do? What can I do from behind bars, right? Because the people that brought the NA and AA meetings to that jail never even showed up. And I thought, how can I, what can I do to help ensure that I stay sober when I get out? Praying. So I started praying. I cried. I screamed out to God, and I... And I threw myself up against the wall, and I hit my knees, and um, I just said, Mikey, you're going to pray every single night before you go to bed. And that's what I started doing. So I start, you know, I'm Catholic, so I start praying some little Our Fathers and Hail Marys, right, um, while I'm in there every night before bed. And then, you know, eventually my prayers progressed a little bit. So one night I'm praying to God. And um, I knew that my youngest son played football. And the only reason I knew that, because I hadn't seen him in five years, was because I saw a picture of him in a football uniform at my mom's right before I got locked up. And that really bothered me because I didn't even, I didn't even know he played football until I saw that picture. So I'm praying and I'm talking to God and I'm asking him to watch over my kids. And um, I asked him to watch over my, my youngest son while he played football. And I was um, just kind of talking to God, and I said, well, maybe when I get out, God, if, if I stay sober, I can go and I can watch him play a football game, you know? Yeah. And um, they call a shakedown in our cell. So I stop praying, and we all get up, and we walk down to the little beauty shop, right, so they can search our cell for contraband. And um, Which is always a hassle because they tear up everything right, and toss everything. Yeah. Right, yes, absolutely. So they don't find anything, of course. So we... Um, we're on our way back from the beauty shop and a male CO. Now, mind you, I saw this officer every single day of my life because I was in the infirmary and there were bars so you could see the officers walking up and down the hallway all day long. So I saw this, this officer every day. He never spoke not one word to me, but this particular night, he says, are you Mikey Bobson? And I said, yes. And he said, are you Daniel Bobson's mom? And I said, yes. 
And he said, well, I'm your son's football coach. Oh, my gosh. And I want you to know that you've got an amazing kid and that he scored a touchdown the other day. Oh, my God. So wow. th- th- that was wow. my moment of clarity. Yeah. That was the moment that I lost the desire to drink and use drugs. Yeah. That was the moment that I knew God existed. And, th- and that in itself is huge because... Just gave you clarity. Just, I mean, humans having to deal with their own mortality. I mean, what's the likelihood it, of all that? Right. What's the... Li- uh, and, I, and I knew with every fiber <clears throat> of my being that that was God speaking to yeah. me through that man. I mean, 10 minutes, 10 minutes, Brent, 10 minutes prior, I was praying for him to watch over my son play football. That was God talking to me. Yeah. And that was my moment. And, um, and uh, I knew that God was going to help me if I did the things that I knew to do to stay sober. And that's what I did. So, I, you know, I, I went to treatment. Yeah. Okay. Went to treatment. Was supposed to go back to the jail for my court date the next day. By the, but since I did go to treatment, they let me go home that night, went to court the next day, didn't get prison, got drug court. And where did I go? After I got out of court, I went to the place that I go for AA meetings, the 623 Club in Belleville. And I got a meeting schedule, right? Mm -hmm. And I went to a meeting that night and I found my old sponsor and I said, will you still be my sponsor? And I got my butt in gear and I started working my 12 steps. I did gateway outpatient, okay? I wanted to see my children, my other children. Before I had this baby, I wanted to see them. I went to the courthouse, and I, and I said, I want to see my kids, right? And they set a court date for me to try to figure this out. They, like, set a court date to reopen the, 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 the my husband had divorced me throughout all of this. Yeah. And that, um, that custody court that I never showed up to when I was in active addiction, they set a court date to reopen that. Now, they were supposed to charge me like 300 or something dollars to set that court date, but the lady just happened to not see that in the computer because God was working in my favor. They didn't even charge me the money because I wouldn't have had it, but they set a court date. I'm at Gateway Outpatient. I meet a girl, an outpatient, who really took a liking to me, okay? She happened to be married to a canine cop whose best friend was a lawyer, Danny Katzman. Wow. His best friend was a lawyer, and this lawyer would supposedly do anything for her husband. And she said, I met this girl at tree- at Gateway, and I really like her, and she wants to see her kids, and I want you to ask Danny if he will help her. That man took my case for no money, no money at all, and I was getting supervised visits with my children before I gave birth to the child inside of me. And by the grace of God, I got my stuff together when I did because they were living in hell with their father. Mm. Things were bad for them. There was DCFS cases. He was fighting. He was still drinking and in mm. an active addiction, and, um, and things were really bad for them. And I got my supervised visits and I had my baby and they were at my house all of the time, all the time, you know, just within a couple months. And, um, DCFS came to my door and they were going to remove him from them. And, um, and because I was mom and I was doing good, I had full custody of my children within no time, you know, and now when they when that PCFS <coughs> case work, story. right and when that caseworker showed up at my door I went to Danny Katzman and I said okay now now we got to get full custody of these kids mm-hmm. and he never asked me for a dime for the original you know for um getting the the supervised yeah. visits but I gave him every single penny I could because it was only right yeah. but then when he got me full custody of them kids he said now this one I'm going to have to charge you for cuz this is juvenile court and that was fine that was fine and I made payments and he helped me and um now here we are yeah. I've got full custody of my children our lives are better than ever I've um you know we've got a house um, my children are all excelling and doing well. My oldest is 19 now. My youngest, the baby, is um, going to be five, May 26th. Wow. I get along with their dad, my ex-husband. I've yeah. made my amends with him. We yeah. get along. Um, and, and my life is just, it's amazing. And it's, I, couldn't, I couldn't ask for, for anything better. I'm literally living my dream right now. I'm living my dream. This is the life I well, always just, wanted. And you've stepped into, you know, the... Where you wanted to, but there was a lot of unknowns into that. Yeah. And I know you just told me before we got on here that you're going to get your master's from St. Louis University. Yes. In social, social work. Social work. Um, I mean, so many different things that you did from that moment. You said it's over. Yeah. I'm going forward. Yes. So what do you, I mean, what do you, I guess, 
Mikey, what's your takeaway from all this? Like from the experiences that you've lived your whole life as that five-year-old scared five-year-old in that house to living through the things that you didn't want to do, but you got caught up into. What would you, to the listeners, what would you impart to the audience of how, you know, what, what is your takeaway from all this? Um, well, I w I want to say this, um, I am thankful for the disease of addiction, to be quite honest, because if I was not an addict, I would not be in the place in my life that I'm at today. So if I had to redo everything... Which is helping people, by the way. Which is helping people. And if, if I had to do everything in my life over again, I would do it exactly the same way. I would do it all again exactly the same way. And um, even even the pain I caused my poor children, um, because because at the end of the day, I, I am better now for those kids than I ever was before, even before I ever picked up my first drug or my first drink. Mm -hmm. I am in a better place now than I've ever been in my whole life because I have peace inside of my soul because I have an amazing relationship with my higher power who I call God. And that is really what this life is all about. God created us with an emptiness inside of us. God created us with, with a yearning and a thirsting for him, okay? And he created us that way so that we reach out and so that we ask him to be in our lives. That hole is supposed to be there because it's supposed to be filled with God, right? But we addicts are such difficult people that we will literally explore every other avenue to mm -hmm. try to fill that gaping hole inside of us, to try to quench that thirst. Sex, drugs, alcohol, food, shopping, whatever. Whatever, we will take every avenue, exhaust every avenue, but the only thing that will fill that hole inside of us is God, right? And that's my takeaway, is that I have made peace with my higher power, mm -hmm. and it has taken my life to a whole nother level. And, and when I was a child, my daddy would always say, Mikey, all you need is God. And when I was in my act of addiction, Mikey, all you need is God. And I'd always say, what? No, the answer could never be that simple. He could never take away this pain that I've always felt. The answer was that simple. All so when, I needed was God. So with the, with, with though, like, how about your mom and your grandmother? Are they still around My mom in is your sober. World? My mom's been sober okay. six years. That's My mom's great. been sober a year longer than me. That's and awesome. that is incredible. Um, my mama got bad. My, my mom was paralyzed from the waist down for three months. She had to learn how to walk again in a nursing home from nerve damage from vodka. Mm. My mom, and, and then she was sober for a while and, and then she started drinking again. And, um, and, um, um, she was, you know, this last time crawling on the ground to her cell phone to call 911 because she was bleeding internally. She was bleeding in her brain cirrhosis of the mm. liver. It, she was going to die. But that was the last time she drank, and she got sober, and she's got six years sober, and my grandma's still alive. That's and, great. And we have the most amazing, wonderful relationship, <sighs> and my dad is still my biggest fan. Wow. He's always been my rock. He's always made sure. He even sacrificed a relationship with my children when I was in active addiction because he wanted to make sure I was taken care of. Yeah. He wanted to make sure Mikey had a roof. And if Mikey had a roof, my ex-husband wouldn't let my daddy see them kids because he knew I was there. But my dad always made sure that I was okay. And him and my grandma and my mom's prayers yeah. are quite literally why I believe I'm where I'm at today. They prayed me into this place that I am in. Yeah. Right. And um, and well, our I, lives I mean, are it's great. incredible. <laughs> I mean, that your family made it, survived it, and are yes. back together and clean and living the good life. And uh, and you're doing great things. I mean, with the yes. uh, you know criminal justice. Let's see, it's criminal justice criminal ministries. Criminal justice ministry. Uh, yeah. And and giving people a chance to find housing and and yes. helping and giving a helping hand. And then you know 
going and getting educated as you have and getting a master's yes. and having to be determined to do all that. Absolutely. That, that's a success story. Yeah. Well, during one of my sobriety. We call that nightmare success. Yeah. At, at, <laughs> yes. And that's what it is. During one of my sobriety attempts after I had my third son in yeah. those three years when I was doing good, I managed to pull an associate's degree. It's crazy. Out of my butt, right? So I had that associate's degree. And um, so, you know, when I when I got sober, I said, I'm going to go to school for social work because my dad was a social worker and a therapist. And that's always what I wanted to yeah. do. Yeah. And um, so so I did and I did it. And, um, you know, I owe it. I owe it to my fellow people, my fellow incarcerated individuals, my fellow people who suffer from addiction, which, you know, as you well know, they're often comorbid with each other. But yeah. I owe it to my fellows to give back. Right. What yeah. was what was so freely given to me? Yeah. I mean, and that was God's will for me. But you're you making see? a difference in a positive way. That's and affecting right. Affecting things in, in a in a positive, good change. And I, you know, I just think it's uh, I couldn't be more proud of how you've handled taking your life and saying, "I'm this is it. I'm stepping into the right direction." That's and right. you did it, yeah. and you're still doing it, and you're. You've got your kids and your family and your yes. mom and your dad, everything. That's what a, what a great story. Yes, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And I'm thankful. I'm thankful to everybody who's helped me along the way. And um, I'm just, I'm thankful to every person who has helped me get to where I'm at today. I'm thankful to God, to my family, to the programs of Alcoholics and Narcotics yeah. Anonymous and to all the addicts that I help on a daily basis because it's in helping them that um, I stay sober. Yeah. Right. Creates a lot of gratitude all the way around. It does. And, and, the, and the last thing I'll say, kind of a neat thing. So when, um, when, I was, I had been sober, I don't know, year and a half, maybe two years. I was working at Hardee's as I was in, um, in undergrad, right? Going to school in my undergrad. And um, I was working at Hardee's and I saw this guy come through the drive-thru and I was a cashier, right? And I saw this guy come through the drive-thru and I thought, is that Lieutenant Paneer, which was the CO from that county jail who God spoke through? And it turns out it wasn't him because I was doing the credit card. So I saw the name and, and it wasn't him. And I, and um, he went on and I, I said a little prayer. I said, God, I would love to see Lieutenant Paneer one day so that I could thank him for what he's done for me. I swear to you, an hour later, Lieutenant Paneer pulled through the drive through at Hardee's and I was able to tell him how he had helped me and what he did for me. And it looked like he, um, it looked like he was having a really bad day that day. And I, I told him who I was and how I was doing and thank you. Thank you so much for what you did for me. And he just looked me dead in my eyes and he said, that wasn't me. That was God. Wow. And then he drove away. That's powerful. That's powerful. Let's leave it there. <laughs> Mikey, thanks for being here today. This Absolutely. This is an incredible story. Uh, Brandon was right. Yeah. Unbelievable. That could be a movie type of story. <laughs> right. Um, listeners out there, thanks so much for being here. Um, love the uh, likes, shares, subscribe. We got, we're got we on YouTube. Uh, leave a review on uh, Apple if you get a chance. Um and my book, Nightmare Success, I was down in Springfield, Missouri this last week and got to see some of my relatives and some people I hadn't seen in a while at the Barnes & Noble. It was great. Everybody, Nightmare Success in and out. Thanks for being here.